Perfect. All right. So uh, welcome to week three of our uh, 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 primer on liberation theology. This week, Victor is going to be covering uh, Black liberation theology of uh, North America. Super excited to hear about that. There are a lot of uh, important challenges that come out of that, uh, that theological system and way of thinking. What I'm going to do is I'll open us in prayer. I'm going to uh, just sort of read to us a, a Franciscan uh, benediction, and then um, uh, we'll pass it off to uh, Victor. Victor, can you speak to make sure we can hear you? Uh, ben, yes, I can hear you. Good. All right. Excellent. Thanks, Victor. Let me open us up here. <clears throat> May God bless us with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that we may live deep within our hearts. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, and war so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in the world so that we can do what others claim cannot be done to bring justice and kindness to all our children and the poor. Amen. Amen. Victor, it's all you. Thanks, Ben. Uh, what a wonderful, wonderful uh, prayer. I will share my screen with you. Are you able to see my screen? Okay, thank you everyone uh, for coming to the third week of our series on liberation theology. Uh, this week, our focus will be on, as Ben said, Black liberation uh, theology. As a person grew up in Nigeria, in West Africa, I have been fascinated by the attempts of African-American Christians to interpret the Christian faith from their own experience, from the vantage point of their experience and history in a way that also tackles the realities that they face daily. Black liberation theology then, you know, uh, appeals to me partly because of my deep interest in grasping fully what it means to be an African American and to live as an African-American in contemporary United States of America. Therefore, I am deeply interested in the question that James Cone, uh, who many see as the founder of Black liberation theology post, if God is good and also powerful, as Black church folks say, why do Blacks get treated so badly? Uh, it is a question that has haunted me as I explore what it really means uh, to do Black liberation uh, theology. Like last week when we talked about Dalit uh, Christian theology, I'm only going to highlight some of the unique features of Black liberation uh, theology. And one of the ways to think of Christian theology is to imagine it as the act or the practice of thinking Christianly about the mystery of God and God's relationship with the world. The act of thinking Christianly about God and God's relationship with the world. That means then that theology, at least Christian theology, is an exercise that cannot be fully done, be successfully done without attending to the realities on the ground. And by realities on the ground, I mean our history, our experience, our politics, our social location, our beliefs, and so on. What then were the realities on the ground that prompted 
Black liberation theology that was developed by African-Americans in the 1960s and 1970s. I believe that in order to really answer the question, we must return not only to the very beginnings of Black liberation theologies in the 60s and 70s, but also to return to the civil rights movement that preceded Black liberation theology. There are so many precursors or forebears of Black liberation theology. I believe though that Martin Luther King figures prominently. James Cone, whom, as I said earlier, many people see as the founder of Black liberation theology, said the following about King. And I'm gonna quote, from King, Black liberation theology received its Christian identity, which he understood as the practice of justice and love in human relation and the hope that God has not left the least of these alone in their sufferings. Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail, of which he wrote in uh, from Birmingham, who had written and published in a local newspaper, um, criticizing the decision of Martin Luther King to come to uh, Birmingham and to protest, to engage in civil disobedience. And to be clear, the uh, clergyman uh, who published that document truly believed that what Martin Luther King and the civil rights uh, leaders were doing were justified, but they disagreed with Luther on his decision to engage in civil disobedience. In response, Martin Luther King wrote, we have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinking darks of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your, blood, your black brothers and sisters when you are forever fighting a denigrating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it very difficult to wait. Many black liberation theologians like the civil rights leaders that preceded them were deeply concerned about the experience of black American communities in the racialized America and the horror of lynching, police brutality, the indifference of some white Christian communities to the horrendous experience of black communities and the quest of many blacks and some whites for justice all contributed in the making of what we now know today as black liberation theology. But it wasn't only Martin Luther King. In fact, Martin Luther King was shaped by an older civil rights leader and also theologian named Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman's book that is entitled Jesus and the Disinherited really shaped Martin Luther's idea of a well-reasoned of nonviolent response to evil structures in our society. A common theme that is found in most, if not all liberation uh, theology is the belief that the God about whom Jesus preached and died is unequivocally on the side of the oppressed. Now this idea was quite present in the writings of Howard Thurman. In his book, as I said, Jesus and the Disinherited, he argued that some powerful communities, some powerful Christian communities or nations have transformed the original teachings of Jesus Christ into an instrument 
of oppression. Here are the words of Howard Thurman. The basic fact that Christianity as it was born in the mind of this Jewish teacher and thinker, Jesus of Nazareth, appears as a technique of survival of the oppressed, for the oppressed. That it became through the intervening years a religion of the powerful and the dominant used sometimes as an instrument of oppression must not attempt us into believing that it was false in the mind and life of Jesus of Nazareth. To put it very differently, Howard Thurman makes the case that some powerful communities have weaponized the teaching of Jesus Christ. It is deeply troubling for it. Example that the earliest ships, slave ships that ferry captured Africans from the continent of Africa to Europe and then on to the Americans uh, was named the Good Jesus. Howard Thurman though argues that when we weaponize the teaching of Jesus Christ, we betray and dishonor his life, his suffering, his work, and his teaching. Racism then, which is really the act of usurping power for the purposes of subjugating and oppressing a group of people from a different ethnic group is a grave sin in the thinking of Howard Thurman and many black liberation theologians. To think of racism as a grave sin, well, because to engage in act of racism for many of them was to indeed to act in a way that dishonors God who made those people in God's own image. James Cohn will be a major conversation partner today. And the reason is because he was the founder or at least one of the founder scholars that really talked about uh, this issue um, that are being picked up by many black, uh, the issues that are being picked up by many black liberation theologians. I must quickly add that James Cohn's theology in some ways is, and I attempt to synthesize the writings and ideas of Martin Luther King and also the writings and ideas of Malcolm X. And this is one of the reasons why some people have flagged uh, James Cone as a controversial theologian, and in fact, for some people, a heretic. Uh, some of his writings uh, today. How about I define Black liberation theology? The way I think of it is to imagine it as the act of thinking or the practice of thinking Christianly and as Black Americans about God-world relations in a racialized country. The racialized America bred numerous theological questions that some African-American covered and explored as they attempted to understand their Christian faith in a predominantly Christian nation and also in a predominantly racial, racially segregated nation. And I believe that as they reflected on this question, the meaning of the Christian faith in the context of a racialized country and in the context of a predominantly Christian nation, Many of them uh, came to recognize what I will describe for the uh, purposes of our discussion today as contextual awakenings. The sudden experience of enlightenment that are deeply rooted in the realities on the ground. And for the remainder of my time today, I'm going to look, highlight some of these contextual awakenings, and then we will uh, uh, go into discussions. Number one, the first theological or contextual awakening that I have this 
concerned is the recognition of racism as a theological problem. Racism, the usurping of power for the purposes of subjugating and dehumanizing a people of ethnic, a different ethnic origins, is a grave theological problem. In some ways, many Black liberation theologians attempted to interpret racism and to engage it from the perspective, not only of the Christian faith, but also from the perspective of the struggles of Africans for justice in the United States of America. Here are the words of James Cone, who is our primary conversation partner today. What deepens my anger today is the appalling silence of white theologians on racism in the United States and the modern world. Whereas this silence has been partly broken in several secular disciplines, theology remains virtually mute. On the matter, white theologians, with few exceptions, write and teach as if they do not need to address the racial contradiction, the radical contradiction that racism creates for Christian theology. For Cohn, racism creates a radical contradiction for anyone who is serious about the God of the Christian faith. We may define justice that they are pursuing as the act or the pursuit of what African Americans deserve as full citizens of the United States of America, for example, equal protection under the law and access to opportunity. We may also think of justice in this context as the desire for Af of African Americans to get what they fully and inherently deserve as God's creatures and as God's image bearers. The second awakening that I have dis discovered is the awakening realization of the symbolic connection between the cross of Jesus and the lynching tree. Uh, in his book, James Cone was really bewildered are the failures of many white American communities not to make a clear connection between the cross of Jesus Christ and the cross of African Americans who suffered under the weight of slavery and racial segregation. He wrote, the cross and the lynching tree are separated nearly by 2000 years. One is the universal symbol of Christian faith the other is the quintessential symbol of black oppression. Though both are symbols of that, one represents a message of hope and salvation, while the other signifies the negation of that message by white supremacy. Despite the obvious similarities between Jesus's death on the cross and the death of thousands of Black American and women strung up to die on a lamppost or a tree, relatively few people have made the symbolic connection. Yet, I believe he says, this is a challenge that we must face. What is at stake is the credibility and the promise of the Christian gospel and the hope that we may heal the wounds of racial violence that continue to divide our churches and our society. For Cone, African American communities have largely identified their suffering and the horrendous act of lynching, which is a very sad, sad uh, um, part of the American history. He's linked it symbolically and theologically with the suffering of Jesus Christ on the cross. Why? Well, because he wants to 
ground the thinking, the theological thinking, the theological interpretation of racism by African-American liberation theologians in a way that places Jesus Christ firmly on the side of those who are oppressed in the US. Another contextual awakening is the awakening discovery that blackness is a mark of God's creativity and not the consequence of a divine curse. Many whites in America had internalized that blacks and Africans are inferior. Black theologians, on the other hand, argue that because they are created in God's image, they are not inferior to other peoples of the world. James Cone will call Jesus Christ a black person. Why? Not because of the color of his skin, even though an, an Arabic person might uh, look darker in skin, but rather because he wants to sit with Christ and to distance him and his teaching from the white American Christians that have supported the oppression of blacks. He also made that connection in order to link the suffering of Jesus Christ to the sufferings of blacks in America. Because of time, I'm gonna talk about one more and then I will open it up for questions. There is also the awakening realization that seeking liberation is the solution to a racially induced form of violence and discrimination in the US. Here are the words, black theology contends that the content of the Christian gospel is liberation. This means that theology is the rational and passionate study of the revolutionary activity of God in the world in the light of the historical situation of an oppressed community, relating the forces of liberation to the essence of the gospel, which is Jesus Christ. I wanna stop here because of our time and I will be willing to take some questions. Uh, just here, and the way we're gonna do it is if I can take one or two, I have a question that I would want us to uh, wrestle together uh, if that's okay. Um, I will hand over to Ben um, for now. Thank you so much, Victor. Uh, really enlightening look. And James Cohn is an extremely uh, uh, stimulating uh, author to read. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can go off mute or you can use the chat. Uh, in the meantime, I have a, a question for Victor. Last week in Dalit Theology, we talked about the issue of specificity. So basically, uh, the Dalit uh, liberation theology movement was so specific to the Dalit community as to not be kind of a universal experience. To what extent has that same criticism been leveled against Cone as he's looking specifically at African-American sort of American context of uh, a black liberation? Well, similar criticisms have been leveled against him and in fact more uh, because of at least some of the earlier writings of James Cone. Um, not only that he was really interested in reflecting as an African-American and also addressing a specific problem and the kind of problem that was only unique to the African-American communities, uh, largely ignoring, say for example, the uh, similar issues that Native Americans were facing. Uh, people were also, have been, had people, a lot of people have criticized them for labeling a lot of whites as anti-Christ or, uh, and part of it was because of of the closeness of his theology, the, the focus on the specific problem of African Americans. So yes, uh, he has um, gotten similar criticisms and even more because of the way he formed his argument. Uh, I mean, if you read some of his earlier writings, uh, you come up with the, the impression that uh, there's some sort of hatred to us. Um, 
some white communities who have either uh, said that racism was bad, but weren't active enough to oppose it, and those who intentionally supported it. So yes, and it's not only to, um, it, the same problem is gonna come up uh, uh, in other areas, not so much in Latin America because of poverty is more of a universal problem. Uh, but it's also important to remember that in his later writings, uh, he engaged a lot of work. In fact, he was present for a lot of black liberation theologians to engage the writings of other Christian communities world who also have similar, uh, or who are still, uh, who are living uh, under similar oppressive conditions. Well, thank you for that. Uh, that that's really good uh, feedback, especially in light of uh, like you said, uh, native native population, indigenous population uh, concerns uh, as well. Um, I do, just as a comment, uh, I grew up Southern Baptist and uh, not too long ago, Southern Seminary uh, commissioned a report on the, um, uh, the sort of um, uh, racist policies that Southern Seminary had had in, you know, uh, in their history. And conspicuous in that report, I read the whole report, conspicuous in that report was a complete uh, a failure to look at indigenous populations and how they uh, may have been uh, uh, discriminated against as well in Southern's history. So just very interesting that that continues to be a, a way that we peel off one population from another uh, rather than looking at us uh, more holistically, at least as, as white people in society, as continuing to divide between races. Thanks, Ben. Uh, ben, is it okay if at least I, if I pose one of my uh, uh, two questions that I plan uh, for us to wrestle with today? Is that okay if we do it now? Yeah, that, that's, that's fine. Uh, I, I do think one question just came in on the, on the chat. Uh, uh, Kirk asks, why do some people write Cone off as just being a Marxist? One of the, uh, again, he borrows, um, uh, uh, just like as we're going to see next week from uh, some of the writings of, of Latin American liberation theologians. He really borrows uh, from some of those Marxian thought. And again, it is important to remember that part of what he does is to ask Marx, for example, what can you tell us about the causes of our problems in our society. So yes, uh, he, in his earlier writings and his later writings, uh, he has um, engaged and interacted, and in some ways have been shaped by the writings of um, Marxists. But not only that, also by uh, the Black Power movements, uh, which for him is very, very essential to the project of Black Liberation Theology. So yes, um, again, uh, we're gonna see this next week because um, if you live in a society that uh, practices a particular social economic arrangement, say for example, capitalism, and you're gonna have a problem with a lot of these theologies that borrow from the critique of society or the practice of societies that use capitalist system uh, as the primary way of social economic arrangement. Um, yes. So he does uh, borrow from there, uh, just like many um, Latin American liberation theologians. Yeah. But I, I, I most quickly also add that at the end of the day, it is important for Christians to ask very seriously about the social economic arrangements in their society. No particular social economic system is perfect. They all have problems. And it is also important not to just look at the social economic arrangement or the particular system on paper, but to ask how is it being practiced in our society? And for Cohn, the Far that uh, he lived in a society where the blacks are continued to be uh, on that the very lowest bottom, moved into ghettos. Uh, again, remember the time he was writing these early works, pushed into the ghettos, um, 
forced to leave a particular suburbs. Uh, for him, it was the system also that was creating poverty among Latin America, uh, among Black Americans uh, in the U.S. So people who are very critical of uh, Marxian thoughts uh, will have no problems in criticizing James Cone for borrowing some of his ideas. Um, you don't see it much as in his early, later writings, but very prominent in his earlier uh, writings. He wrote a lot of books. Great. So uh, you had a couple of questions for us, Victor. You can go ahead and share those now if you'd like. All right, just uh, we'll try the first one and then uh, Ben, and I will also hand it over to you to moderate it. Uh, but here is, uh, I'll share my screen with you. Has the liberating power of the Christian gospel been compromised in the racialized American communities? Ben, I will hand over to you to moderate it. All right. Thank you, Victor. Man, what a stimulating question. I have a million thoughts about this. Um, I'll give everyone just a, just a moment to sort of collect uh, their thoughts. And uh, for people who want to speak in the room, they can either, I can either pass off the microphone or I can just repeat it. Uh, feel free to use the chat as well, everyone. But uh, yeah, I love this question. Thanks, Victor. Yeah, I think as things are coming in, people are saying yes uh, to that. Um, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of activity in the chat, Victor. If, in case you're not looking there. Yeah, I am watching, guys. Um, uh, would you be okay uh, again not to put those that are answering on the spot? Uh, those who said yes, of course, if they want to uh, comment, why they think uh, so. Okay, this is Pastor Jana, and I just think that um, any time we use power in ways that Jesus never would have, um, of course, it undermines the way power was meant to be used. I feel like Jesus coming and dying, laying down power, redeems power here on this earth. It is not power over, but power to come under the oppressed or the struggling or the suffering and to lift them up. And so anytime um, the, the gospel has been co-opted to use power in ways that Jesus never would, then we have removed the redemptive message of Jesus Christ from the use of our power. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is Kirk Livingston. And uh, um, Victor, it's, it's such a complicated question <laughs> to type out in particular. <laughs> I see some people attempting to get words and I was trying to as well, but since the mic is here, um, I, the thing that the thing that I, I keep coming back to, and I wrote it in the comments to the chat, that the fact that we struggle to recognize some people as human is so odd to me, and yet so <laughs> a part of our culture, part of our humanity, part of who we are, I guess. And nobody would ever say out loud that. Some people aren't human, and yet the way we treat each other, I see it in myself, frankly. Um, across races, it's socioeconomic as well. Uh, and I think this is part of the awakening that needs to happen as I 
as I think about it myself. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Hi, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. This is Melissa. Um, I guess I have thoughts on this because uh, I, I am a white woman, so I don't deal with um, a lot of the same oppression that others of uh, you know may have felt in our racialized America, as you've stated it. Um, but I do see, I feel, uh, I do see the ramifications of it um, in our other, and you know, in other communities, and and I, I, some communities draw closer to God um, in their community uh, under the this oppression, um, and then some communities actually fall away from God um, under this oppression. And I feel like that's interesting, um, but that doesn't mean that. Uh, God and Jesus and His presence in in um, on Earth and and in wanting to release oppression um, that that there isn't a power that's able to be grasped there. It's just the church. Uh, in many ways, the white church, especially, has not been very good at embodying that liberating power. Um, and it's it's very saddening to me to see how people have had to pull away um, and communities have had to pull away um, and either uh, um, find a way to pull closer to God within their own community or to fall away from God in their own community due to that, that uh, you put it as compromised. Um, and I think that, that that brings me a lot of sadness and hurt. Thank you. Anyone else? I have two quick thoughts about this, uh, Victor. The first is, uh, you know, I've read uh, Jesus and the Disinherited. By the way, for anyone who's looking for something to, to pick up and read, Jesus and the Disinherited is a fantastic, easy to read book about um, uh, Thurman's experience. But one of the things that he says, and I think you alluded to it in the quote that you had here earlier, uh, Victor, is that uh, he is asked sometimes why it is that he still follows the God of his oppressors. Uh, and he talks about that in the book, about how he does not see the Jesus he follows as the same Jesus that uh, his oppressors follow. Um, and so whenever you ask, has the liberating power of the Christian gospel been compromised? I, I kind of have two answers. You know, answer number one is, yes, I think it's been compromised in the message that the powerful give about who, what kind of God we serve. But then the second part of it is that I don't think that there is uh, much that we can actually do to compromise God's good news. And so, and I think that people like Thurman are, are very eager to point that out. Um, so on the one hand, we can stand as almost antichrists, right? Things that are against God, the liberating power of the Christian gospel. And at the same time, God will keep moving and leave us behind. And that is my concern about how we hold racism and power, uh, especially in, in America, um, that, uh, that we will miss the movement of God uh, in that. Um, and that leads me to my second thought. So I've had the privilege and pain of reading Cone through the lens of Moltmann. And one of the things that Moltmann does with Cone's work is to talk about liberation from two sides. He talks about liberation from the standpoint of the oppressed. Uh, and so he invokes people like uh, Cohen and Gutierrez and Sobrino and, and Minjung Theology and a whole bunch of others to talk about how um, uh, the oppressed need to be liberated. But then he goes on to ask the question, what does liberation look like for the powerful? How can they be liberated from their power fetish, from their need to control? And so I do think that our power fetish has compromise the Christian gospel to the powerful. Uh, and I think that we lose that in, in the discussion sometimes. 
Thanks, Ben. Hello. Hi, Kirk Livingston. See, I was just thinking that the, the uh, <clears throat> I was writing in the comments about uh, the visceral reaction to the cross and the lynching tree. When I read that, it was, it was a tough book to read. It seems to me, and there, it seems to me that there are some barriers that we need to that we need to jump over to make that connection. But if we could make the connection between the cross and the lynching tree, that would be a particularly American theological, um, I don't know, insight movement ahead. If we could, if we could start to understand that on a broad scale, uh, I, I think it would could would could maybe lead us to. Uh, repentance and, and such things. So anyway, I, I appreciate Cohn's focus on that and it's a shocking book, um, but the truth is, is right there. Thanks. And thank you. Um, ben, should we go to the next one or should uh, do a lot of people have questions that we, uh, you want us to, want me to respond to? You what, uh, Victor? Let's go to the next question. We only have a few minutes left, and so if people have more thoughts that they want to uh, throw into the ring about this question, they can they can just go ahead and say that uh, after the next question is presented. And, and I think that we're going to have to wrap up here in about let's say five minutes. So okay. um, so that will that will uh, limit our time somewhat. All right. Okay, well, it's, it's, it's similar to the first one. I'm gonna try to share my screen again with you. Um, can you see the question? Um, are you able to see the question? Are uh, the contextual awakening, some of the ones that I've mentioned, um, that I inspired some African-Americans to formulate black liberation theologies are still relevant today? Again, people can go off mute if they want to ask a, a, a give an answer to this question or ask a follow-up question, or we can use uh, the chat and I will uh, just say those things aloud. Thanks, Ben. Hey, Kirk here again. I, I hope you can hear me. Um, I just wanted to say that the one to third awakening you discussed, awakening, disco discovering that blackness is a mark of God's creativity and not the consequences of divine curse. This is uh, such an amazing uh, potential awakening. And uh, I just think if we could somehow understand this and somehow awaken to this, it could change daily life in so many big ways. So I think it is absolutely. Um, um, still relevant today per your, per your question. Thank you. Victor, would you see the uh, the contextual awakening that Kirk talked about, about uh, seeing blackness as part of God's creativity? Would you say that that could be extended to uh, the sort of uh, intersectional stuff that's happening today with LGBTQ and different other kinds of uh, 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 identification strategies that are that are happening in um, the Western world? Oh, yes, I mean, some people can uh, make such um, connections as well. And again, remember that part of these, all of these theologies that we're talking about um, are really are born out of a deep desire for someone to understand the person's faith, in this case, the Christian faith, but also from within the vantage point of a person or that a particular community are uh, viewed and treated in the society. So yes, the same principle can uh, be translated into different um, 
contexts and of life. Yes. And I do hope that, um, uh, as many of us know, is a very, very important issue in the U.S. today. And I, I do hope that someday in the future that perhaps Ben, uh, you, you, you can um, uh, explore that further. Because I think it's a very important issue. It's it's an issue that has divided the church, an issue that also can uh, make the church become, recognize uh, its role in embodying the goodness of liberation in our world. And I'm sorry that I didn't go through all of the context, all of the contextual awakenings. Uh, if Ben wants all of them, I can email them to Ben. But I wanna quickly add, before Ben uh, uh, kicks us out, uh, that one of the problems, one of the criticisms that people uh, have addressed to Apache um, has actually come from African-American women uh, whose theologies are described as womanist theology. And so they like what black liberation theologians have done in terms of dealing with the issue of race, but also very critical of black liberation theology movements for ignoring largely the issues that are relating to that are related to gender uh, biases and such as sexism. So I wanted to just point that out. Thank you for coming. Thank you for um, uh, staying with us for the next uh, for the last three weeks. And next week we'll wrap it up. We're going to move from the US Latin America, Peru in particular. Ben, over to you, please. Excellent. Thank you so much, Victor. Very stimulating stuff. Uh, and, and, you know, really relevant to uh, the sort of issues that we're still dealing with, with, uh, you know, racism, which includes uh, immigration, uh, you know, uh, uh, inequality of outcomes. Uh, I know that our church has been reading through uh, how to be an anti-racist. And so a lot of these concepts and a lot of these uh, um, uh, theological ideas that Cohn and Thurman and others talk about are definitely uh, wrapped into uh, the conversation of racism that we're having in the country today. So thank you so much for that, Victor. Next week, we'll be, uh, as Victor said, talking moving to South America, so looking at uh, Latin American uh, liberation theology, uh, which again is very stimulating uh, in its own right. So I appreciate everyone's time and uh, hope to see you uh, again next week. And if you'd like, you can spread uh, the message that we're, that we're doing this. I know that through Zoom, uh, it has been kind of difficult to get the, get the message out. So uh, email this to your friends if you think that it's uh, stimulating and we can, uh, we'd love to have more people uh, online. So thank you so much, Victor, and we'll see you next week. Bye, everyone.